DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is officially live. Now you can legally bet on all your favorite sports anytime and anywhere, right here in Ohio with DraftKings. For a limited time, new customers who sign up with code DEFEND and bet $5 or more will receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. DraftKings has the best features including same-game parlays, player props, and more, with fast and easy payouts right at your fingertips. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers can use promo code DEFEND to get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on anything. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code DEFEND. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 21 and over and physically present in Ohio. Valid one offer per first-time depositors who have not already redeemed $200 in free bets via pre-launch offer. Minimum $5 deposit and wager. $200 issued as bonus bets. Eligibility restrictions apply. See dkng.co slash oh for terms. Welcome to another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's returning guest is David Nick Ellis Wilkinson. Welcome to the show. Thank you. The last time you were on the podcast was to discuss the first film documentary that you've made, which was a, which was a fascinating look at a, a particular st- a, a, a narrative in film that maybe not everybody knew about um, about where film originated. And you took us you took us to Leeds uh, to explore that idea. Um, and for this for the- idea, facts, even facts. I mean, I think I prove it that the world's <laughs> first film was made in Leeds. And there are there are people who say, "Oh no, that's nonsense. That's nonsense." And I keep saying, okay, give me the proof, the actual physical proof that somebody else was before him. Uh, And that was the great thing with Le Prince, because not only do we have the film, which a lot of the other pioneers, there is no film. It's one of the women in that film died 10 10 days later, and I found her grave. And you can't, um, you you can be kind of... um, um, loose with the truth on some dates, but physical things like that with a death that is recorded, then mm. that fixes it in time. Indeed, and and you know, ideas of truth and 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 and, and, and I think justice is is where you've gone with your with your next film, getting away with murder and murders, and you've purposely made that point with putting the S in in brackets in the title. Do you want to give a brief description as to what? this documentary is about? After the war, the in fact, even when the war was raging, is that the uh, allies, which, the, the key allies, which was the United States, the UK, the Soviet Union, and France, decided that they already knew from about um, 1942 onwards, they knew the Holocaust was happening. And they realized that they would have to have these very special trials for crimes against humanity and genocide. And on, in October 1945, they signed something called the London Agreement, which I think in the film, uh, as I explore, it's a bit like the film industry. There's, there's clauses in there which I consider to be get-out clauses. And the Nuremberg trials which had their sentencing um, 75 years ago uh, on the 1st of October. That's why my film coincided uh, with that historic date. That's when I released it. Mm. Um, That was trying the sort of high command. The Americans only, British, Soviets and French, pulled out. And it was the American military had 12 successor trials. And my film picks up really what happened after that, because I've been researching this for 18 years, and I discovered that roughly 99% of those who carried out the murders in the Holocaust, this is not the normal killings that you get in any war, the actual murders, they were never prosecuted. And as one will discover in the film, is at least 400 Nazi war criminals lived here in the UK. And I 
for years just couldn't understand why didn't we prosecute all these people back in the late 40s? And why, when we discovered that they were living here and in America, and in, a lot of the Nazis lived under their own name back in Germany. And very, very few people did anything about this. So that's basically what the film's about. Why did 99% of the people who carried out the murders, why were they never prosecuted? Yeah, and, and, and upon my first viewing of it, my first thought was, A, a par- it's a powerful film, and B, as a, as, a, as, a, as a British person, it takes your breath away about what you thought you might know about recriminations after World War II. Because we grow up with the story that there was the Nuremberg trials and that all the wrongs were righted. And clearly what you've uncovered, what you've what you go on to explain and illustrate in your film is, and as you said, 99% didn't. There was very little recriminations, in fact, as to what happened during World War II. Very little indeed. And and uh, there are many different reasons for that. And obviously I <coughs> all that in the film. But um, it, it's extraordinary that now, when it's all, almost too late, there's a great flurry of activity. In the last few months, there's been a number of cases. There was a, a woman of 96 who was being tried, and uh, she kept saying she was too frail to uh, go to court. And then in the end, they found her running away. I mean, she was fit enough to actually run away and they grabbed her and got her back. So it's still, you know, it's still going on, but it it is now almost too late. In in the film, I I shot a sequence in Nelson in Lancashire because it was believed that one of the men that was part of the uh, the 14th Waffen SS division was living there. But uh, we found that he died in 2017. But he lived in this country unpunished since the war. He was a mass murderer. Now you, men- living in an or- you mentioned living in an ordinary street next to lots of ordinary people, and they would have been horrified to find out. You, 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 you mentioned when you, in your introduction about what it was about that, that you know this is 18 years, 18 years ago where you began research, as, as you describe it. So. So this is a film that's that has taken eighteen years to come has come to fruition. Is that is that was it something you set out to do, or is it just a subject you were interested in and you just began to explore it and it became a film later down the line? How, how, what was the journey of that? No, years? The, so I've had the idea for a lot longer than eighteen years. Okay, and in two thousand and three, I was distributing a film called Taking Sides, written by Sir Ronald Harwood, who just won an Oscar for The Pianist. And Harvey Keitel and Stellan Skarsgård, the stars of the film, couldn't do the publicity with me. So I said to Ronnie, would you undertake a short Q&A tour and do lots of interviews with me? And he said, yes. He said, but I've got one proviso. I'm writing a screenplay for Roman Polanski um, of Oliver Twist. And he and Polanski had worked on The Pianist. And he said, as long as you get me back into London uh, each evening, in fact, we couldn't. One of them, we went to Glasgow, um, but I did get him back the next night. And so I spent a lot of time traveling with him in a car. I hired a driver because I thought it was far too important for me to drive in case anything happened. And um, we talked and we talked and talked. And in that conversation, I said, look, this is an idea I've got for a documentary. What do you think? And he said, it's terrific. He said, you've got to go uh, and start making it. And interestingly, he told me that The Pianist was a flop when it came out. It got made because of Polanski. They got money from here, there and everywhere. But people weren't going to see it. And then it happened to coincide with the Oscars. And it was nominated. And he said, after that, um, people flocked to the cinema to see it. it. It needed that. Um, sort of badge of approval because it was felt at the time too much had been covered about the Holocaust. And that's exactly what 
happen to me. So I started to try to put together the money. And every year I would go to Sheffield for DocFest, which is, most people would say, is the second most important documentary film festival in the world. But it's more than a festival because everybody involved in documentaries from all over the world go there. And sometimes I think they have as many as 6,000 people. So all the commissioning editors of all the important television channels are there. And I would pitch it to them and people would say, David, the Holocaust has been, you know, one man, a very unfortunate saying, he said, the Holocaust has been done to death. Oh dear. And they would not see that there was an idea that occasionally there was some flicker of interest. People would say, well, can you get Hitler into it and the rise of the Nazis? And if you can get Hitler in the title, Nazis in the title, then it's going to do really well because ratings are very good on those sort of programs. But something that was looking at, you know, why so many of these Nazis got away with it just wasn't of interest. So it just became this enormous slog to get the money. And I was beginning to despair And then I got in London, I boarded a bus. Very, very rarely get on a bus. And it started to rain. And I had a, I've got this big white beard and I had a big black hat on and a big coat. So I obviously looked very, could be mistaken for somebody who's an Orthodox Jew. And I sat down. And at Gooch Street, which is the next stop, a man got on. And although it was very cold, it was late October 2018. And he he had this T-shirt on. That's all he was wearing. And I could see he was either a boxer or a bodybuilder. And he was very tall. And he walked past me and he said, Shalom. And I thought nothing of it. And I just said, Shalom back. You know, I know a lot of Jewish people. One of my oldest friends, Gary Phillips, used to say that to me a lot. And then... He set about attacking me personally for all the people that I was killing in Palestine and that I was a dirty Jew. And he carried on with this kind of real anti-Semitic rant for about a minute, a minute and a half. And I got up and I said, look, I'm not Jewish, something I later regretted. And I walked upstairs away from it. And it was very frightening. And it was, and I don't usually feel frightened. It's really strange. I don't think I've really felt it much in my adult life. But that wasn't the shocking thing. What I found most shocking in this crowded bus full of British people, and you believe all this nonsense that we're all told that somehow Britain is superior. Um, Britain, you know, we British would stand up. We'd never allow this to happen. And this bus full of Brits, they did nothing. They all looked very intensely into their phones or they looked out of the window. None of them looked towards me. None of them looked towards this man. You know, they weren't going to say anything. And I thought that's what it was like in the early 1930s in Germany. So I got off the bus, I rang Don McFay, my DOP, and I said, right, I'm going to start making this. And um, I started with my own money and I have very little left because on my last two films, I was the majority financier. And unfortunately for me, a company called Q Media went bankrupt last year. And only when they went bankrupt did I find that they'd sold both films all around the world. And I never got a penny. So money, money that I was expecting to come in never did. So I sort of carried on and I got bits of money here, there and everywhere. But I still made the film for way less, way, way less than people normally make documentaries because I filmed in in 10 different countries and I have over 30 people working on it, the majority of who were paid. There were a few people who said to me, David, I, I would really, I believe in what you're doing and I can help you. Johnny Suriano is a very good case in point because John is, has a well-paid job in risk assessment. And he came in to help me with a bit of the research. And he said, I just don't want any money. But I don't like not paying people. But he was, he said, look, I I just don't need it. He said, you need it. This is an important subject. So um, I persevered. And strangely enough, the pandemic worked for me because I was able to get 
John, my uh, John Walker, my editor, who's very well paid. He's at top of the game. He works for Netflix and the BBC and Smithsonian Institute and all of those. And suddenly, he, there was the work dried up for everybody. It sort of came to a halt. And he um, he said, "Look, I'm I'm around," and I I offered him some of money. It wasn't nothing, but it wasn't what he normally got. And he said, yes, I'll do it for that. And the extraordinary thing was is that I'd, I'd started editing it myself with, a, with a, an assistant editor. So I, I could go into him with something that was already there. And then the, I, it became apparent that I couldn't go any further. So we were doing all this remotely, and I was telling him what I wanted. I think he quite liked it because he would get – a lot of the day to himself. And then I would watch what he was doing. I saw it. And then I said, no, no, this needs to be done and that, and you need to bring this in. Um, so he, I got the skeleton there and he then added the rest of the body, if you like. Hmm. And then it, it occurred to me, we couldn't go any further because I needed to rethink some of the scenes, which I knew I couldn't film. How was I going to approach that? It made me very creative in a way that I possibly may not have been had. There had been no lockdown. And uh, I also knew I had to film one more interview to sort of tie everything up, but I still didn't know the questions I wanted to ask that interviewee. So I said to John, right, let's, let's stop it. So we stopped it on a lunchtime on a Thursday. That afternoon, he got a phone call from someone saying, John, we're, we're embarking on this massive um, number of documentaries and we don't have enough people to work. Because what happened is suddenly all the commissioning editors woke up to the fact that they couldn't film documentaries, but what they would do is that they could make documentaries that only needed interviewees and that they could do um, without going on location. And that involved having a vast amount of archive so suddenly editors became in great demand oh wow so i finished that with john in something like june 19 uh, 2019 uh and then i shot a bit in the september that year and then i couldn't get him back again until uh november and we worked on it and then it became this monumental task of clearing all the images because I'd chosen so many of the images myself without knowing whether we could clear them or not. And I'd worked very closely with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Yeah. Who are, um, they have a fantastic archive. And Steven Spielberg also has his own archive which that's there. And I used a lot of footage from them, but there was still, you know, I've got 400 photographs or um, archive footage in there, 400 different sec bits, all have had to go in, you know, and find out who owns it. And I had to bring in somebody, a, a German young man who was just brilliant. And he found these photographs. It's extraordinary. So there, there were these particularly... So, it, so, so what you're saying there is, so you you accumulated pictures that were that matched what you were talking about and were were linked, but you but you weren't sourcing them at the time, so you were having to sort of go back and sort of find out how to clear them. So what what I was doing, I was just getting holding images. So this was when I was working with somebody called Giovanni. Okay, and I I edit as soon as I start filming because I, uh, so I I film my edits, I film my edit. And usually one I'm trying to get, it's nearly always because I'm trying to get more money. And um, so I first of all pulled them from the internet, just images I thought fitted, I images I knew I'd never be able to clear as well, hmm. but just, just to be holding, to put something there. And then I contacted the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and they have this, this extraordinary archive. So then it be just, just becomes a going through everything. And most of what they have, not all of it, um, is uh, they own and it doesn't cost you anything. There was one bit of archive footage we found there 
which was of a, you saw in the foreground a dog running, and then there's some children. And then into the far background, you see a line of people. And then they suddenly all fall into this pit. And then another line of people come there. And then they suddenly all fall in, because obviously there's no sound, and they fall into the pit. And then on the other side, you see all these people drinking beer and having sandwiches or whatever. Mm. Because the, the, what happened is in all these Baltic countries, the locals would come and watch this spectacle of the Jews being mass murdered. It, was, it became um, execution tourism. And it became a very popular form of entertainment Blimey. for these people. I mean, it's just horrific. There is obviously a lot in the in the film itself. There is there is some brilliant use of um, of archive and photographs, but also you you do a lot to camera. You have talking heads, and and I felt like in, in certain instances, certainly when you're getting into sort of the minutiae of what you're what you're uncovering during your investigation is. I feel like you were playing the role of the audience, almost like as if as if we were kind of vicariously experiencing the film through you at times. That's that's what I've done with all three of my films, uh, and I think this one it probably works the best. I've always had this since being very young. I've always liked showing people. You know, when people when I, I was an actor and we were in a play and we'd go to Yorkshire, I'd love which is where I'm from. I'd love to show the rest of the the company, Yorkshire. And I, I, I've always liked that, I, you know, show people things. And that's what I felt I wanted to do with the films. So I'm on this journey. And it's also, it's a difficult one because I don't want to know too much, but I've got to know sufficient because I like, and this was something I pioneered with the first film, is that on that there are 42 scenes that are just one take, although one of them's cheated because the camera person got something wrong. Not Don, but someone else. And um, I had to do it again. But I, because I don't like those programs like Who Do You Think You Are, which I've, I've had known people that have been in them. And they've told me that the production crew, apparently, allegedly, manipulates it so they only introduce you to the ancestors that they want you to meet because that story is visually more interesting and they don't want you to meet these other people because that's boring. I, I can believe that's the case. I don't know it 100%. It's just what various people have said. And I thought, well, that's cheating it a bit because everybody but that person knows the story. And I just felt because... If I'd just been the writer and uh, presenter, if you like, then that would have been fine. But because I'm also the director, you need to know an awful lot. So I would know as much as I needed to know, um, but not too much. The pieces to camera, and I tried to keep them down to a minimum on this one, uh, obviously, I knew that because I'd had to write them before I came to, to film it to work out what I wanted to say. But with a lot of the uh, interviewees, I tried to keep something back, particularly when we went on location. And I thought, because it's talking heads, they can be very, very boring documentaries. Uh, and I didn't know to what extent... I, uh, you know, I could rely on archive footage because while I was making it, I had so little money. I thought, well, and if I'd had to pay the proper going rate for the archive, I'd never have done it. I did pay some people. Hmm. But the original archive budget, I was told, somebody budgeted it for me, had between 178,000 and 217,000 pounds. It was going to be somewhere within that. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't make the film for anywhere near that. Um, so I decided to make it interesting to take or film a number of people where these mass murders took place. 
that that would lend something to it. So I took a man called Robin Lustig, who, although has been described as the thinking man's John Humphreys, <laughs> because he was the number two um, radio broadcaster for years. He um, was the, the main person in, in a, a BBC Radio 4 news programme called The World Tonight, which went out every weekday at 10 o'clock. So he's brilliant and all that. And he's interviewed everyone from, you know, Mandela to Bill Clinton to you, you name it. Yeah. Tony Blair, whoever. But he'd never done a documentary before. And I took him back to Lithuania where his um, grandmother was murdered by the Nazis. And we also looked at some other things in the Baltics. And I went with Mary Fulbrook, who's a professor of um, German studies. And we went to Berlin with her. So I tried to film as much as I could in the places where these atrocities took place. It's always difficult on a very low budget because... So going around... Well, to be honest with you, David, it would feel almost prohibitive on a low budget to, to go to that much trouble with, 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 with what could have been done just to camera in a room. You know, it's like it's... But, but that would have made it so boring. No, I've, I've, no I've, that's what I'm saying. I, I, that's why I applaud, what, I applaud the choice you made, but it's, it would feel like on a low budget, that decision is almost like off the table. But instead, you've kind of... You, you've obviously, through your previous films, you've proved how effective it can be because in a way what i felt watching it is that when you were when you were in situ talking to an expert or you were in nelson talking to someone about the story in nelson it felt like i was waiting for something to be uncovered and that meant there was a balance then when we turned to like we're talking to professor so and so professor so and so then we're suddenly like we're in listening mode now because this is an expert just going to give us either a, a really detailed thing or a macro understanding so that when we go when we go to Nelson or we go to Berlin, we kind of have more context to it. And I, and I like that that interesting take. But then there's the there's the the one the the bit when you're in um when you're in East London and you're reading the news the newspapers. Um, the guy was on the um, the war crime. Yeah, Philip Rubenstein, and we're in um, we're in Bermondsey. You're in Bermondsey, yeah. And you were and 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 it felt very very alive as a, as a moment. You know, like it, I mean I mean like you say you wrote it, but the element of you two exchanging bits of newspaper felt like a real dialogue. Well, no, no, on, on that one, I didn't. So um, that one, I didn't write. I mean, uh, so obviously I write the structure of the script. I have a skeleton structure. Okay. Lots of documentaries are written in the edit. But because I was going to places, so when it was something like Philip, I just asked him questions. It was just a conversation. I knew I was going to feature the newspapers and I knew why we were there but I needed him to give me some background. But the problem is when I... So what happened is that not having much money, I had to go to Don McVeigh and Rory Smith, who did the sound, and I said, look, I, I need to do a deal with you here. Um, I want to go to Europe, and we... Uh, I don't have much money. I always try and find the best hotels to stay in. I always feed people well. Because I think that's important if you're not, you know, you're, you're, it was punishing driving around and then filming. But we could only take Don's car, which was an estate car. So Rory and Don sat in the front. I sat in the back. But next to me was a whole load of equipment. And in the back was more equipment plus our bags. So I couldn't take a fourth person. And I couldn't afford to hire a, um, a sort of people carrier um, to go around Europe to take that person. Plus the fact, not only would that be more expensive, hiring that, this is the, the real problem with sort of micro-budget films, is I would also have to pay that person. So that meant I had just two options, either to find... If I couldn't take someone, Robin, it was different. We flew into Lithuania. But with Mary, she happened to be in Berlin at the time. So I fitted it around her being there. She has a flat there. And so with Gunsberg, which is where Mengele lived, and he visited, so Josef Mengele, the world's most wanted Nazi war criminal, 
the angel of death, responsible directly or indirectly for killing 400,000 people, murdering, not just killing, murdering 400,000. He twice went into back to Germany with a passport in the name of Josef Mengele, an Argentinian passport. So I wanted to go to Gunzburg, where he'd done this, which is where he's from, and his father was the largest employer. And I just couldn't find anybody that lived there who was willing to talk on camera. So I have to deliver that to myself. The, um, I was very, very fortunate in Austria. Austria was always going to be very important to the film. And I, there were plenty of people in the UK I could find but again, I would have to fly them out there to join us, you know, so the timing had to be right. Um, they would, um, you know, I'd have to pay for the hotel, all of that. Um, and I just didn't have it. You know, it was, it was only a few thousand pounds, but, it, you know, when you're micro budget, that's a lot of money. Mm. And as I said, I'd run out of my own money. Um, and um, so, you know, that there's that, extraordinary serendipity is I was talking it over with Mary before I went to Berlin and she said, Oh, this is marvelous man, Winfried Garsha in, he's a real expert on it in, in uh, Austria. So I, um, I got in touch with him. He's a bit wary and he did it. So it's, it was fantastic to go to be shown around Austria with him and to discuss it in Austria. And yes, I could have filmed one of these people, an Austrian, who's, you know, living and working in London, but it would have been dull. It just visually wouldn't have been very interesting at all. And particularly, I always knew the film was going to be long. I didn't think it would be three hours. And when you're doing something like that, you can't have just talking heads in the studios. And I think, I mean, it's interesting because the, the reviewers have been very good to this film. So far, Touchwood, it hasn't had a bad review. And um, it, none of them really mentioned the length. One or two mentioned it, but not in a derogatory way. And, and what I was really worried about is that they would pick up on the fact that it's mainly talking head. But I think, but I think that, but I think the mixture of what, what the way you mix it up and it feels like you're, I mean, it's dramatic. Let's let, let kid ourselves. The story is dramatic, but you you lend that to the visuals. You know, like the the sort of litany of um, of sort of summaries of the people that got off. You know, the, the kind of headline grabbers in terms of your your story, where you tell us who they were, what they, how many people they'd murdered, and you know that they lived to a ripe old age and you know and died peacefully and stuff. That the use of that as a kind of punctuation, or what's going through, is almost like to me. It felt like. As an audience member, I was like being reset to keep keep me keep me. You know what else is going to tell us now? What else? Are, you know, like it felt like a real, a really effective use of 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 sort of putting just putting almost still imagery, you know, text on screen, which is not always the best thing in film. But actually, in and amongst all the talking heads, it was really effective in in us understanding how much of it just slipped through our fingers. Yes, um, that was an interesting thing. So. What I've got throughout the film is the giving examples, very short bursts of the Nazis who got away with it. Some of them were caught. And originally, I was going to have a, an ex-Scotland uh, Yard detective do that. And he was going to mention them. And COVID happened, and I couldn't film him. And he's quite old now, and he just felt very vulnerable, understandably. So I thought, how can I do this um, and get it across? Also, the trouble with the, when you're with a talking head, this is a slight advantage for me talking to camera, is they may take four minutes, even with very detailed ed editing, you get that to four minutes, whereas I can say it to the camera in a minute and a half because I, I can control what has been said. And that has an advantage. And I thought, well, I would never have got 20 people in. If, and I was going to cut the policeman throughout the film. He was yeah. going to come in and say, and there's another one. There was this person. This is what, And then there's another one. So 
I decided, well, that we can do visually. I can get a photograph of them or we can come up with a graphic to do it. And I can say who they are. I can say briefly what they did. And then I can say what happened to them. And that became incredibly effective. So it meant I got more, I covered far more people than I would have done with an interview. Mm. And that, because I'm usually, I'm a bit reluctant to use too many graphics because it becomes very television. And I made a film um, in 2008, released in 2009, called Charles Dickens' England. And the critics really, really went for it. And the main thrust was that was a television idea missold as a feature film. And the way that it was put together, they said, is just so television. And they were correct. And, you know, that again was the use of graphics and those sort of things. So I was a bit reluctant to do it, but I didn't have an alternative because we didn't know how long lockdown was going to finish, uh, going to last. Hmm. And it worked. I, you know, Dame Eileen Atkins, I mean, she's a friend, um, does the readings brilliantly. I, I decided with a lot of the narration not to have any emotion, both my narration and her narration, just to do it very matter of fact because I thought that that had more impact. And I originally looked at having Jewish actors, a very famous male actor I went for, and he never got back to me, his agent never got back to me. And then I went through lots of extremely um, well-known female Jewish actors, and for whatever reason, they said no. And then I went to Eileen, and I said, look, I didn't suppose you'd do this for me. And she was very hesitant. And I think in many ways, it, it really works that she's not Jewish because she doesn't have, you know, I, I think that emotion would have come through in a way because obviously there's a lot of Jewish people who've seen it. And people who didn't even have, you know, relatives as far as they know in the Holocaust, and they they get very, very upset when they see it, understandably. Mm. Uh, the, the 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 glue I felt that 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 sort of held the whole story of what you were saying is the 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 interviews you got with Benjamin Ferenc, Um because there's he was so candid in the way he 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 sees his role, but also he see he, he's he's an eyewitness of what of what went wrong at the same time as you know which is the basis of your which is the whole foundation of what your your documentary is about. This, he's, getting that was extraordinary. So I'd spent years trying to get to him and he'd ignored me. And then finally I found a route to him. But it I should, Sorry, was, I should say, David, he's the last... I was just going to explain who yeah, he is. Yeah, sorry, go on. Okay, go on to that. Um, so Ben, uh, Benjamin Friends, it became very important to get him because he's the last living prosecutor at from the Nuremberg... Uh, war crimes trials and he was in the so he prosecuted he's only 27 years old when he did it at the one of the successor <coughs> trials which is the Einsatzgruppen trial the Einsatzgruppen um, murdered about one and a half million Jews so there he was a, a witness to all of this and I met with his son who lives in Wales now and his son said look I think you should do it when I'm over there And I'm going to be there for his 100th birthday in March. So either come, I'm going to be there for the whole three months, but I'd prefer if you did it in January or at the end of March. So I said, okay, so that's 2020. And I missed the January slot because it took me so long getting my I visa from the American embassy. And so it was going to be the end of March, 2020. Oh, blimey. And John Suriano, because he's in risk assessment, said, David, I really think you need to bring this forward ASAP because I've got a funny feeling about this virus in China, plus the fact Ben is about to be 100. You must get it. So I, after a great deal of back and forth, I finally got them to agree to shoot on the last day of February. And, of course... You know, two weeks after that, we had lockdown. And if I didn't have Ben, 
I wouldn't have had the film. And the extraordinary, again, lockdown worked for me because, because I've got it all in my head. I know so much of this. I wanted to film in Argentina, Canada, the Ukraine, and Israel. And if I'd have filmed that, it'd have been a mammoth film. Yeah. So when, when lockdown started, I thought, oh, God, I, I, I'm nowhere near to finishing this film. What am I going to do? And I, I sort of was very down about that. And then I suddenly thought, actually, why don't I just watch everything? And so I spent several days going through all the rushes. And I realised watching Ben's footage, coupled with it, everything else I had, I suddenly realised I've got the film. I don't need to go to those places. I can get over what I wanted to film there very easily. Mm by in voiceover or, or not to include it at all. Um, and that was a revelation. And I, I worry if we hadn't had lockdown, I'd still be filming now. I'd be making this mammoth, bit like the documentary show, which is nine and a half hours long. That's what this film would have been. I'd still be shooting now. That's interesting. That So, so in a way, lock, lockdown forced you to think, I've got, I've got, have I got enough? And you de- and you decide you were able to see because there was time to do what you ordinarily wouldn't have given yourself time to do to actually have the confidence that you had. Yes, I, I'm a great believer in low budget um, broadens the mind. I mean, not just low budget, micro budget. So you have to. Uh, so I was a, an executive producer of Jerry Rothwell's film How to Change the World, and we had 1.27 million pounds for that. So getting away with murders is not even made for 10% of that. And that film was shot in it was shot in Canada and edited in the UK. And we had a huge amount of archive footage. And when all the money was in place, the, the film had to be completed as quickly as possible. So it was a very short period compared with what I'm doing. So I suppose, and Jerry had been working on it for a long time. But I don't think it filmed anything. No, he hadn't filmed anything. Selected some of the archive footage. So from start, getting the money to finishing that was something like nine months. And then 12 months later, it was in, you know, or 12 months from the start, it was in the Sundance Film Festival. I don't have that. So um, that creativity comes on that very, very long gestation period I have to think about it while I'm trying to get more money in. Uh, and that just throws up lots of things. And you go, right, here's a, this is what I'd really like to do. I'd really like to take a group of people and I'd like to go there and I'd like to do this and that and the other. I'd like to find local people. Um, for instance, there's a, I film um, now a memorial site to murdered French men and women, none of them Jewish. Uh, 750 were murdered and this village called Orodur Sugalem, was um, raised to the ground. And what I really wanted there was to interview someone. Now, I didn't have the money. I didn't speak French. I had a very, very part-time assistant. Again, she, she's Jewish, and but she was working on lots of other things. She did it for no money. But what I'd have really liked is to employ a researcher in France for a month to go and find me somewhere or someone mm. who could come there and I could interview um, and he could tell me all about it because I just didn't want to keep doing that television thing of talking to the camera. But in the end, I had no alternative. But I think the way that we've edited it and what we've shot gets around a lot of the problem that I had. Um, and it's just, it's... I know filmmakers are always talking. I'm, I'm the first to do this. I want more money. I want more money. Yeah. But because I'm also the producer, I find that David Wilkinson fights with that bastard David Nicholas Wilkinson, the producer, who's always trying to put him in a box. He goes, taking away my creative freedom. <laughs> um, and it is, I do wrestle with it. But because I've done both roles, I was a producer far longer than I was ever a director. Um, I understand both very well. So, in a, so in a way, there's, a, there's, there's, there's maybe, I mean, it's not an illusion because clearly 
more money does give you more choice, but more choice is is an illusion that that's the solution, I guess, isn't it? It's not it's not always the best solution, is it? More more choice would have, uh, I think, made for a poorer film because I would have taken people out from the UK to Austria and having an Austrian do it, or the, well, it's the person I had was Austrian, so I would have been taking him out. But it would have, I think with Winfrey, for instance, in the scene in Austria, because we hadn't, I don't like to talk too much to the people I'm going to interview. And the, there is a real danger in that, that what Ronald Harwood used to talk, I wrote a screenwriting book with him, and he would, and Steven Spielberg asked him to write a treatment for something, and he said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and he never did treatments for anyone. And he, Spielberg said, but I need it for the studio. I've always had treatments. He said, no, I refuse to do it. He said, if you want a treatment, then find another writer. I don't want to do it. And Ronnie had this thing that if you do a 20-page treatment, you write out, you come up with these incredibly good ideas, and you write out those ideas in the treatment. And then when you do the film, you start on the screenplay, you look at it and think, oh, I don't like that anymore. I don't like it. It doesn't work. And so you don't put it in the screenplay. And then when the film's made, you realise, he said, that the thing that you put in the treatment actually did work and you should have put it in. So he felt creatively right. And he was very fortunate. You know, he didn't, he turned down so many films, even before he did, uh, he became very well known because of his rule about it. But he was a playwright, so he always had income there coming in. Um, and I think there's um, what would have happened, and it, it, to some degree it happened with Robin because we went on a plane together, is you spend a lot of the time with the people travelling there. So they've answered a question to you off camera, and when you come to do the interview because I write some of the questions down, but then I get in, as you and I are doing now, we just go along with it. It's all improvised. Mm. And there's many times that I, I've heard from other filmmakers that they um, have thought that they filmed something because they've discussed it with the person beforehand. And when you're filming, you think, oh, well, I've covered that because in your mind you've had that discussion and then it's too late to add it because you have filmed in a different country what for you was because you would you went into this with a perception of what you were going to unearth on, on, on so what for you in, in 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 everything that you went through in in how how justice was diluted and diluted over the over the decades from the kind of the what would seem now looking back the well-meaning intent to get justice after the second world war which like you said like in the example you give in the film where you go yeah this reads like something i might get in an entertainment contract which is best endeavors is a kind of catch-all for i won't do it but i'll, I'll pretend yeah. by putting the contract um and then over the decades we've just seen it dil diluted into what become 99 percent of people never got never got prosecuted so what what for you was was the most shocking discovery that you made going going into the film that you didn't know got before you started making it? Was there anything particular that stands out for you that's like sort of shame on the world almost? Uh, it's difficult to find just one thing. I, I suppose I always knew there were Nazis here because there was... A very famous case, he, he briefly comes into my film, but I don't go into it in depth, a man called Anton Geckus. And the only reason I knew about him was because Scottish television made a documentary saying there's a Nazi who's killed many, many hundreds, if not thousands of Jews and Russian prisoners of war hmm. living in Edinburgh, working for the coal board and running a bed and breakfast. Yeah, that was and quite the tale. And the British government did nothing about it. And what happened is, like a lot of these people, these Nazis, they were enormous egos. And Gekas was furious that they named him, you know, because people avoided him in the street. And he hated that. So he took Scottish television to court. 
and he lost. So basically, it, it was a private prosecution to say, you've libeled me. And the result of the court case was, no, they haven't. So that, what, what that told the British government is he's a Nazi murderer, you know, part of the 14th Waffen SS. And so what did the British government do? Nothing, absolutely nothing. And the only man who was prosecuted here, Anthony Savonio, was 53 years after um, he arrived in the UK and he was sent to prison for murdering 18 Jews, though in reality it was a lot more. And he was the only one ever prosecuted. Mm. And so speaking purely from being a British citizen point of view, that shocked me that there were as many as 400. I didn't realise. I thought it was like... 50 at the most. That's what I thought. Although, you know, but to allow 400 suspected Nazi war criminals, because that's what we have to say legally suspected. Mm. They're all dead, so that I, they can come and sue me. Um, <laughs> but, but a lot of people believe it was a great many more than 400. And yet we ignored them. We just went, well, it happened a long time ago, a long way from here. Let's not bother. Two, two, think, two things that stood out for me in terms of watch, thinking, well, thinking you know what the history was, was, I mean, Benjamin's sort of frankness where he's, I think he says something, if, if it's not him, f- forgive me for bad memory of it, but in the film, they've got 3,000 suspects and they basically at Nuremberg say, we've only got 22 seats, so pick your 22. You're like... That's that's how you that's how you went for justice. You went based on the number of oh. seats available. That that to me was like was like this is how serious we're going to take it. Is that <laughs> it's about r- num- numbers of seats. But it it was so you have to remember that so many people didn't want the trials to take place, particularly in America. They tried to stop them. So the, so what happened is they had to rush it. And it, it, it came down to these very practical things of where can we hold the trial? And because we've got to have the world's press in there, that's very, very important that we're seen to be doing the right things. So we've got to have the space. We've got to have the prosecutors. We've got to have all of this. And literally, Nuremberg was the only building standing where they could do this. And it was very small. There was nowhere in Berlin. There was nowhere in Munich. There was... There was just nowhere else. And it so just very practically, when, when they worked out how many of the press could be there and they rebuilt things, is that's it. There, there were only seats for, um, you know, just over 20 people. And it was which of the, which of the people do we select? And they knew that, that these were going to be shut down. So they had to, they could have tried to find somewhere else, but there was such a momentum going for it at the time. They just went with it. And they all themselves knew that they would never get proper justice. To some extent, they were a show trial. And as a, after the, the International Military Tribunal, which is what everybody knows as Nuremberg, mm. three of the Allies pulled out, the British the Soviets and the French all pulled out and it was left to the Americans. But it wasn't even the American government, it was the American military who said, we can't stop here, we have to have more. And there became 12 successor trials. If it was left to them, there would have been 50 of them because there was so much there. But but eventually the American government said, enough's enough, we're coming home. So they knew that that's why the successor trials there. Which are 12, but each case, so they became like the doctor's trial, the Einsatz group and trial, they became individual trials. And at each one, there was between 22 and 24 people trialed. They could sometimes fit in two more chairs. And that's that's why. Just sheer practicality. And this is the world is run on such things. If if they'd found a building that was enormous and they could have tried 150 people each time, they would have done it. Yeah, no, it's it sort of makes you sh- it shudders, and there's lots there's lots in your film that that sort of there's lots of other moments and details that you uncover that give you equal sort of lack of disbelief in the in the human in, in in the human there, race. There's, some, there's something strange about us in the film industry 
because a film is many, many, many years in the development. And then the whole structure of the film is based upon military campaign. I don't know if you know this. Particularly after the Second World War, the, the, the film industry and the BBC, and to some extent ITV, w- was run by people who had, you know, put campaigns together in North Africa or, mm. you know, in the Battle of the Bulge or something. And so we're very structured and everything's thought out and planned because we've got the time to do it. But so much of life, and particularly you know, after the Second World War, because um, there wasn't the time, everything was rushed. And that's the thing that I found you know, so extraordinary, is decisions were made, both at the height of war when things were being fought, mm. but also... Um, when it was coming to trials, is there was no real time to think. I mean, I I planned my film far more afford, certainly far longer, but to some extent more um, intensely than they thought about the um, the trials themselves, because they had just such a small amount of time to put this all together. And, and Benjamin Franz, again, is, 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 he's the most extraordinary man. There were only going to be 11 successor trials, and he went off with his team to search all these things, the files in Berlin. And in among it, him, somebody working for him, they suddenly came across these papers. And they were all um, detailed registers of all the Jews that had been killed by this group called the Einsatzgruppen. And up until then, the, the Allies had never really heard of this term. And so Ben went through everything with, I think he had about 50, 60, 70 people working for him. And they quickly found um, the, the figures showing that they'd systematically murdered uh, at least a million people because he just got a, a calculator. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Germans, is an extraordinary thing, they um, kept such detailed files. So on the 15th of March, we killed 11,163. On the 16th of March, it was, and, and it listed where they did it and who by and all of that. And that gave him the case. And he rushed back to Nuremberg to see uh, um, uh, Taylor... God, what's his name? Thomas Taker? I can't remember. Anyway, the, 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 God, his name's gone out of my head. This is trouble with getting over. Telford Taylor. So Ben rushed back to uh, Nuremberg to see Telford Taylor, who was organising all of this, um, the trials and, and all the, the sort of minutiae behind it, and said, look, I've just come across this extraordinary case, and there's... Uh, mass murder on an industrial scale, and it's all written down here. And, and Telford Taylor said to him, "I'm said, he said, Ben, I'm really sorry. We've got no more money. We can't do it. The, the American government has said we've got to close it down. You, you can go along with these number of trials, but after that, no more. And, um, you know, Ben said, but we've got to do it. This is mass murder on an industrial scale. It's one million people at least. We And Telford Taylor said, is there any way that you can do it? And he said, yes, I'll do it. And so it didn't actually cost them any more. He just had to put it all together. So if he hadn't found that out sort of slightly by accident, and if he hadn't been so insistent, that trial would have never taken place. And, and it's just, again, it's serendipity. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If that man hadn't found that file on that particular day, would they have found it? I'm sure there's a lot more we could talk about, but there is obviously a lot in your film to cover. So I think we've covered quite a lot. Yeah, so it just gives me to say thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Um, thank you for highlighting this film. It's been a long struggle, but um, it's for any filmmakers listening to this, I, I sometimes, I not sometimes, I genuinely believe the harder it is to get a film off the ground, not only is I think it more rewarding for you as a filmmaker. I genuinely believe it's a better film. 
for that struggle. With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing Slash to be in your band. Next up for lead guitar. You're in. Cool. <laughs> yep, even easier than that. And with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One and a member FDIC.